Welcome back to another episode of the Rankable Podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank. And today I'm stoked. It's it's such a weird time in the world of AI and SEO, but I am joined by no other than none other than Jeff Coyle, who's the founder and chief strategy officer at Market Muse. He's been in this world for 21 years. We were just talking before we started recording this episode, just how you've been having these conversations, you've been talking AI and what's happened in the last week, last month, last three months, throws everything on its head. Thank you for joining me today, Jeff. How you doing, man? Oh, thanks, Garrett. Always fun to discuss. I uh, I recently, you said 21. I recently realized it was about 24 um, Damn. Since, I, since I was optimizing my first websites. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, that gets, it gets more cringy every day as that number goes up. But uh I'm trying. I'm just still trying. <laughs> no, and I mean, it's 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 good to to inform the history because that is actually the theme of this episode in the context of NLG, natural language generation, which has been the mainstream topic both in the content world in the SEO world, and <laughs> you you've been there, and there's a lot of misunderstandings, misrepresentations of the history, and so I just kind of want to start from the beginning, like SEOs don't understand the history of NLG for content marketing. Where do you begin? You know, I think you begin at kind of the desire and why of that went through and, and that search engine optimization professionals and, and content teams. I mean, there were no content teams in the you know early 2000s. I mean, we were at, at, at um, one of my first companies was a uh, knowledge storm. We were selling leads to software companies by doing content syndication. So we were getting, we we're like, give us all your brochure wear, give us all your white papers. And we were making them accessible by optimizing like directories of white papers. We were trying to convince companies like Dell and IBM to have content on their websites. I mean, it was, you know, that, that was 2000 and 2001. Um, but that that I think is really critical because you didn't have the it wasn't ubiquitous and understood that you would have content on your site and it would then generate money. So when people started, you know, the earliest people got that religion early, right? You may see that's what early people would do. But a little bit later on, it took for the businesses to get there, and then you started seeing you know support for um, the creation of content and the desire to create content at scale early. So what did you have? You had exploitation. We're seeing exploitation now in generation, but you had exploitation in the form of doorway pages. And the doorway page was a page that was like, had nothing on it. Sometimes you could refresh it and it would shoot to another page after you clicked it. You know, you had all this, you know, this desire to build lots of like ways to catch as many flies as possible. It's kind of the same, right? Theoretically, I'm trying to widen my net, create a presence. So what came out early, you can't really call it natural language generation, but you can call it having the same desire. So there were spinners who could take data, you know, uh, templates and spin in, you know, I have a three bedroom, two bathroom, home or boat or ranch style or, you know, and, and then I can start to build many pages, potentially powered by databases, potentially powered by otherwise. So I think the first views of this as like desire, desirable from a web perspective were in that, you know, 2001, 2005 time period. Um, you then get into people trying to like turn this into science, right? Uh, and there's a company called Statsheet who, if you want to do the the, back, the deep background on this, it's worth looking at. Um, there were multiple people thinking statistics were the easy way because they're only thinking about mad libs. This is, I, I use the term mad libs for, for this, right? Uh, which if you're not familiar with what mad libs is, gosh, I'm old, but mad libs <laughs> is basically um, you put a line where there was a part of speech and you plug in a word that comes from some data or from your head. It's a fun party game uh, to you say, give me an adjective. And you know you write it in then you read a sentence and it sounds funny. Um, but they were doing that with data for things like financial, BI, BI systems, in, intranets, where they're pulling data from a database and they were making it into something readable. So the stock, stock symbol, right, has a current price of uh, this company was built in 
Perfect. Right. And stat, stat, uh, some of the stats companies, there was a Stats Inc., I believe, was one, um, which is a very intriguing company. If you like sports, read up on all the sports data usage on this. I mean, it's, it, there's some magical stuff. Um, but there was the use of these template driven things as early as 06, I believe, 07, going all the way into um, 2010, 2011, where you had a lot of this. And this is when I really started getting excited about, about this technology and, and, the, and the, the ideas. There's a company called Automated Insights. Um, there are a number of companies who from 2011 to 2015 and 16 started to think about it um, and build these um, empowered templates is what I would call them, right? Um, and most notably, I'm and I remember in 2016, I sat at um, a now called Content Tech, but it was an intelligent content conference um, and listened to um, the Washington Post lead for their software called Heliograph. And Heliograph was the first time I put two and two together about how I can do this. Right. And I was like, oh, my gosh, we can content marketers can do this. Right. Um, and it was because he said this was the use case. He said Pre prior to building Heliograph, we only covered seven to 10 percent. I'm making up the number because I can't remember seven to 10 percent of local, state and national elections with Heliograph. We cover them all. That's a value to society. And I was like, it is a value to society. And then he said, prior to prior to Heliograph, we only covered 10% of the Olympic events. But with Heliograph, we cover all of them. So now everyone knows a little bit of information about all the events. We don't have to say that 76 kilogram judo isn't important. Right, because hey, if you like watching judo like this guy, it's super important. Um, but for most people, that's not the one that's you know the 100 meter dash, right? And, and that's that's going to be on national television, so likely not going to get reported on. You know, the rich get richer with content uh, based based on editorial and based on rank. So they were thinking about this the way that I feel SEOs are now thinking about this, right? I can cover my entire buyer journey. I can be a thought leader on many things. I can be a publisher where I couldn't before. They got religion on that as editorial as early as that 2015 time period. In 2010 to 2015 was when really start, you started to see the template outputs uh, come out. And they weren't as simple as Mad Lib. So Yahoo was a great example. Um, the use of automated insights, the use of a number of, there's another company called ARIA, A-R-R-I-A, -A, that's worth looking through. A um, number of these uh, uh, these types of companies, which were, I like to call them empowered templates. They probably would say, blank you, Jeff. That's not what we did. Um, but there is the easiest way to digest it. Heliograph at Washington Post created a rule-based engine when there was exceptions. And I like to use judo as my example. Why? Huh. Judo has an exception. What's judo's exception in, in Olympic events? Two bronze medals. Why? Because it's a, it's a knockout. And at the end of this, the, the semifinal games, there's two losers. Thus, they both get bronze medals. They don't make, it's part of the history of, you know, they don't make those two people battle for the bronze medal. They actually get two. So what happens if you have a template and you're covering judo? it will only say one bronze medalist. So you need an exception rule that says judo is different for our template engine. Easiest way I can describe how NLG was first applied is judo. Um, and the funniest use case of that is I went out that day and I searched for judo in Market Muse and like did the research. And one of the exceptions that Market Muse surfaced was make sure you cover the fact that there's two bronze medals. And I was like, we have this use case. The use case can be applied to free form. And so the difference in the way that people think about this is we weren't thinking about the modern goals of NLG, where free form text generation, you know, when I was blabbering about this in 2017, it doesn't rely on structured data. You input an input phrase, a sentence, a paragraph. Now, you know, we're, we know that they can turn into prompts because we're all talking prompts. Like we were, have been talking prompts for years. 
Um, human interaction, you know, allows that output to be controlled. And then whatever that generation algorithm is, produces an output as a continuation of the input. So question answering, summarization, and then getting into free form. That's the trend, that's the mental transition of those modern goals. And that's what people aren't always seeing. They're seeing, they're trying to equate AI equals a large language model equals this thing that seems to do everything, but it actually doesn't do everything. But AI can be built to do almost anything, right? It's just not the, the one thing you have access to that's AI that can do everything. Sorry, I'm probably tracking down, but it's really important to see that at each stage of this process, the most elite SEOs have been thinking back to 2002 and saying, I can do something with this. They pull out of the top, some goodness comes. I mean, there's some really, really strong search professionals who have been building content at scale for many, many years. Um, the industry is sometimes referenced as macro SEO. It's sometimes referenced as uh, dark, programmatic. Dark, dark or programmatic SEO. Uh, I've heard some other uh, names for it. Um, and, and, but if it exists, does it exist in a way that produces extremely high quality content? Only, you know, I can name them at the top of my head, the people. It's one of those types of situations. And they were doing extremely creative things to get informed templates to be successful, right? They, there was also some lower quality solutions that, you know, yay, it's working, crash. Yay, it's working, crash. By the way, if you're using current solutions, you're going to be in a yay, it's working, crash mode um, if you're not thinking critically. Uh, but they, they'd all gone through that that experience uh, and the applications in local applications in publishing or applications in statistics. Um, the, the, the bright publishers have been, I mean, I wouldn't say getting away with it. They've been on the forefront for now eight years. Right. So this is not new baseball. Right. Um, and the key is it's democratized, but it's being democratized in a way that equates one term, two terms that don't mean what that is. AI does not mean large language models. Large language models are a thing. Natural language generation doesn't necessarily only mean large language models. And natural language processing doesn't mean only those things, right? So the deep learning advancements, and these are things to look up if you're really interested in nerding out on the Transformer XL, GPT-2, right. ExcelNet, Grover, CTRL, um, and I'm saying these words so you can like type them in and look them up, but these are all deep learning advancements that allowed us to be faster, better performance, uh, predicting samples on long sequences. They allowed us to have prediction of the next word given preceding text, right? right. Um, that's the key. And it allows us to have short-term memory and then it allows us to have longer term memory and it allows us to um you know so you go through this process it's so much easier to understand what's happening in this world if you go through the history and watch it happen like and i got to watch it happen live and i'm sitting there like yeah i'm gonna release something and then you know <laughs> I released, so i released a large language model with fine-tuning options two and a half years ago right? It was ultra expensive. Mm -hmm. The bill to generation was eight to $20. I mean, so what do we have to charge for a generation? hundred bucks to make it a viable product. So not tremendously successful, if you remember. Um, but those are the types of things. So, you know, Grover is a great use case. And I, I tell everybody, read how Grover worked. And that was from the Allen Institute for AI in 2018, 19. But it was a well-known model for generating fake news. And you say, stupid, why is that interesting? It was really interesting because it could detect fake news and also generate fake news, right? So it could condition and it made it, it was a, for me, it was the first time that a solution came out and it was something marketers could understand out of the box, mm -hmm. okay? That's what Grover's did for me. 
because I was able to um, socialize this as a concept easily. Whereas before it was so esoteric and right. weird and, and, and yeah, you know what I mean? And so like, if I were, if I were going through the spirit of this, I would be thinking Mad Libs to rule-based templates to generation to fake text that reads like it's real to today. That's so perfect. Say, that's, so that's the exact kind of like, Ex- like breakdown of the how it's become so sophisticated over time and the big call out to your point is it's it's not like these models ai and large language models are two different things they don't understand anything it's all predicting what the next word is predicting what is the best word understand the context you know, right. and with connections, but it doesn't actually understand everything. And chat GPT to your, is like the best, you know, like you were saying, Grover of the out of the box understanding is like the mainstream can use chat GPT and be like, okay, even though it's very problematic, which is, you know, something we'll kind of talk about a little bit more. <laughs> right. So in terms of content quality, can you expand a little on that of where we're at and what are some of the implications? Gosh, yeah, content quality is is something I'm so passionate about. Um, you know, I remember sitting in in 2006 talking about if all of this goes bananas, right. content quality will then always be king. And I've always been been saying that. And I'm saying this is the true path. The true path is exhibiting your expertise. And it took me a while to realize and even have a shred of empathy, which is terrible for me to say, but in, in arrears for editorial excellence and the value that, you know, subject matter experts, no matter what type of coverage they cover, have, and that their processes are extraordinarily important to understand. My perspective initially was like, no, the data is obvious. Why would you not cover this in this way? Right. But it was like, wait a second. You've got to weave together that magical knowledge, institutional knowledge, that tribal knowledge with the data to truly win, right? And that was something I learned part way because it was an edit, me saying, hey, editors, do this. And they're like, yeah, yeah right. What the hell are you? Um, and, me, and then going and saying, okay, well, how can we actually weave in data into this? Well, we're seeing that at, a, at this epic alliance right now, but it right. all drives back to the why is for quality. And Google going from P to A T to E A T to E E A T E trust. How did Google's original, how did back rub, how did, right? How did the initial rent calculations try to discern trust? It was saying on a natural walk through the web, which is what the original concept was, you might find this page, right? right? Because it's linked, right? Now, then it was like, okay, well, we're gonna say that if you're linked more, you're trusted more. So we're making these co- correlations, right? Now you say, wait a second, that's not good enough. Why spam? Why uh, democracy? Just yep. to be blunt, democracy means I can publish a website and you can publish a website. We can both publish a website. We can publish a website together. Um, and, uh, and and we all can publish websites, right? That ain't good for assessing authority. I need to assess authorities different, authority differently. Man, uh-oh, that can, be, <laughs> that can be adjusted and manipulated. So what did we do? So if you look at, um, uh, there's a great book called The Beauty of Mathematics and Computer Science, a real page turner uh, by John Wu, uh, who was a research scientist from Google in uh, China. Um, and he wrote some of the early algorithms for top, topical authority. Um, by the way, topical authority not invented by the guys on YouTube saying they've invented what? this. <laughs> what? Um, I have the domain name, topic authority, topical authority.com, topic authority.com. Uh, and I bought that stuff in 2000 and I won't say which, which time, but yeah. yeah. But um, they were looking to say, how can I discern on a topic site or topic site section or topic page level whether this site is likely to produce content that is high quality without reading it? Right. 
relevance that's key. and value. Yeah. That's key. So the math behind that was quality assessment one. Why site section? The example used in the book I referenced um, is uh, John Johns Hopkins is widely regarded as an expert in medical science, right? Um, but their careers page isn't. Their career right. section isn't. But their career section, if they put a job post up for, uh, you know, medical transcription, is the careers page truly the authority, right? And so you get into, oh gosh, we have to actually calculate this as a massively multiplicative model of authority. Yes. It's gonna, it's got to be. Every topic page, topic site section, topic site pair. And prior to a certain timeline, it wasn't possible. Them computers didn't possibly calculate that, right? Well, let, let me ask that's, you that's this. Where the, that's the origin of quality, is realizing that math can't work. And you're not fast enough to solve that problem. Well, right? yeah, they want, to, they want to make it all mathematical and use these algorithms to assess it. My question to you is, do you think... Google is keeping up, like even prior to, you know, this like boom of AI generated content that's going to flood the web, you know, there's been a lot of criticisms of the quality of search results. Um, And, you know, that's why like TikTok's a competitor now or Reddit's a competitor for people using search. Do you think Google can keep up or do you think they're screwed? I think they've caught up. I think they've they've consistently, they think they've consistently caught up. Um, I think their moves, and by the way, Jeff, speculation, the last piece, this last right. one, everything else I've said is is, is legit. Um, uh, but Jeff speculated right most of the time on these predictions, but uh, been way, way wrong a lot. Um, but uh, they've caught up and they've shown it, right? They It's how quickly they can catch up, right? right. So Panda, for example, was a great catch-up move. Um, it was an ability for them to uh, propose hypotheses about what quality is or isn't hmm. and test it out with small subsections, validate whether it was, you know, so, I mean, the example that was used in the uh, internal meeting that was leaked 2000, gosh, I don't even remember what it was, um, was something like uh, red websites are bad. Like, and then let's validate that. No, actually red websites aren't bad. That's a stupid hypothesis. Well, let, let's, let's, Get the hypothesis, whatever that was. Um, so you can go hypothesis. So if you see these characteristics, it's likely to say, likely to mean this is bad. Now let's punish the bad, right? Um, so you then you weave into applications of machine learning, like right brain for context analysis. That's a magical thing. You see um, uh, additional uh, uh, trainings of, of, of link quality assessments, both the link itself plus the edges of the link and how they point to one another. So they're doing a great job. And content quality, the actual page itself, is a thing that exists as a page. And it's a thing that exists amongst a pool of pages or a blob or cluster. Hey, when you're starting to think of why we built things the way that we did, right? So the cluster of pages. If I go write the best article, ever written on the brand new iPhone. This isn't the brand new iPhone because I'm not made of money, Um, but it is um, great. But if you go throw that page on garrettsblog.com, even if it's the most beautiful blog ever written, it's not going to win immediately. You go throw that same blog on CNET, it will. And it's not just because, you know, Red Ventures is awesome and so big, we don't don't know where they are. They're amazing. They're everywhere. Um, It's because they have a great history of editorial breadth and depth of coverage of Apple and other mobile and review products. Well, how do you systematize and mathematize that? These are not words. I'm going Don King a little bit. Um, But how do you actually make that into math? Google has had that answer for a very long time. But to make the on-page factors, the on-page assessment of quality work, all the other things have to always, always work. Or else you're going to have problems. And But as people get smarter and become smarter searchers, it becomes even more problematic as the teams at Google that need to make money, need to actually continue to make money, it becomes a more challenging problem too, right? That church and state of money is always going to be a challenge, right? So you've got a knowledge graph, you've got a local panel, 
You've got a PAA. You've got an ad pack. You've got a local pack. You've got situations where search results have some results that mean one thing and some results that mean something else. Right. Right. That's not intent, by the way. That's different meanings. Then you've got situations where Google's guessing that there's multiple intents. Right. So if you if you think about all of those challenges as search engines become smarter, yeah, they're doing a great job. The level of complexity of building that and, and having to actually be able to assess the quality of content is so immense. I mean, as, as someone, I built a search engine platform. Yeah. Uh, focus crawler based search engine platform in 2007. Right. Um, and it's so complex. To even do these really specific use cases. We're having to do every use case. Right. And hey, so there's going to be exceptions. Yes. I mean, to your point, like, you know, there are outliers that they can't control for everything. There was, um, I think this is going to be published in a few weeks, but uh, basically there's an article that came out from The Verge about how they duped Google with a product page for the best printer that was crap content. But because it was The Verge, to your point, you slap it on there and they have all those signals and they rank. Until they don't. <laughs> until, <laughs> until they don't. But you're right. No, no. What you said is super important. And I think it's so relevant to what we're dealing with now. I love exceptions. Exceptions are, we learn from exceptions in SEO, right? But exceptions don't mean something is correct. Exceptions don't drive causation. Exceptions don't drive correlation in many cases, right? So, So you've got to be really wise as a marketer to not fall victim to this false type statement. The false statement that because I see this page Ranking from the verge with garbage. Garbage can rank. Garbage can rank. In the context. But it has to have all of these other context dynamics. And this is where correlation SEO strategies of the past have bamboozled so many. I mean, you know, I, I like bamboozle better than snake oil salesman, but you see it still. <laughs> you see it still say you see it still where it's like. Do it like me, right? And it will work. And this is mainstream in SEO. There are why SEO forecasting can be such BS half the time because it's so complex. You can't actually even barely like project. Yeah, Jeff and Garrett don't know what they're talking about. Look at this site. I found a site the other night. Okay, this is what I do in my spare time. I found a site the other night. One point seven million entrances a, a, a month. Mm -hmm. And at least 90% of the content is generated, right? Mm -hmm. And providing absolutely false information. I found it. Yeah, absolutely. And false on purpose to to make a point that it works. I'm like, so I found this site by by. A particular set of practices that I do to find the uh Sites that might be part of PBNs um, or might be being used by uh, SEO touts right. uh, to to say this this works right. Uh, they're sometimes they're called uh, one condition sites or one factor sites where they're building a site to prove an exception. Right? It's kind of like the uh, nonsense word SEO of the of the mid two thousand. Like I can get this crazy word to rank. Like yeah, you can, and you can get it to rank using some like artificial practices. It has no use case in real life. Like it, it has, no, it has some use case. It can well, it's not you, sustainable either. It can give you some leaning. It can it'll give you some learning, right? You can learn from it, but you certainly can't apply that same knowledge to the verge. No. It, and and, and it, you can, the fundamentals, sure. You can say, yeah, generally, there is some correlation between links and traffic. Absolutely true. There absolutely is. Links are good. Jeff's not saying the content's everything. Links are good. Right? Um, it doesn't directly relate to that outcome. Can you manipulate these things? Absolutely. You can manipulate the hell out of these top, these factors, right? But they aren't good for baseball, right? And they're not business responsible. Right. Exactly. And I mean, ultimately, that's what it all comes down to. I, I want to pivot quickly because I could talk to you about this stuff forever. Sure, sure, sure. Before this conversation, you know, with, you know, your 
experience and and what we're all going through with AI generative tools, with you know Bard and ChatGPT and OpenAI and Bing and all that. You and I were just talking right before this about what the last week, last few months have been like in our world. And I'm very curious your perspective on what it's been like, and then also what you think it looks like going forward over the next few weeks, months, years in marketing and SEO. First of all, you got to talk days and weeks now. I know. Um, hey, you know, I think that the, the uh, an actual take away, take away of where it's headed is um, so, and I, it, if, if you haven't read the type of stuff that uh, Paul writes or um, R O E, by the way, if you're looking him up, and Mark, Marketing Artificial Intelligence Institute is publishing. Go, go read his posts on LinkedIn or, or his blog. Um, really talking about how things are changing so fast, you can't possibly understand this unless you look back and think critically about like what what to know, what to, what to know. Like we've moved in a month more in this space than we ever historically have. The exponential. Ever movement is, is 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 crazy uh products are releasing sooner than probably the businesses want them to release because there's just i mean it's not hysteria but it's close to hysteria right there's mass doc, doc democratization of this information but i think the biggest takeaway is not all ai is a large language model not all natural language generation is a large language your use case may be able to be solved with AI, but it probably won't be solved with this AI. That's, that's just something to think about. And so, so don't say, oh, it doesn't do this, thus nothing can do this, because it's not true. It's absolutely not true. Um, over the Christmas holiday, I built a language model for $600 and covered compute time, right? On a dedicated server, right? Yeah. I mean, it's possible. Um, Stanford just, uh, a team at Stanford just built a, a 52 instruction set language model for a thousand, well, under a thousand dollars of compute time. Um, so stuff's going to come out that breaks the world and it breaks the world in this little space over and over and over again. It doesn't mean what you may think it means in that generative content can now get better or it means that more use cases are going to be able to solve be solved with AI. Um, uh, but don't treat this don't treat a large language model as Mad Libs. It doesn't work, right? right. It's not the use. It's not the use case. Don't treat it as your as your, um, you know, your reference for hockey statistics. Which I put a post up one time where it was hilarious. It was like the only because here's the here's the, the 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 ethically challenged problem here is the person who's looking for who won the 2020 Con Smythe Trophy doesn't know who won the 2020 on life trophy right okay? so you're writing an article about that it's your moral and ethical responsibility if you're going to write an article that says who won the 2020 con smite the person you write that won it had better be right right or else the person looking for it will find wrong information a large language model not specifically built right an ai built not to specifically answer that question and get that answer wrong. If you get that answer wrong and publish that, the entire walls of, just imagine the entire walls of your office. Imagine your customer just yeah. being, bull, being bulldozed, right? If The Verge says the best printer in the world is two sticks of gum and a thumbtack that Garrett made in his garage, that's really, really bad for The Verge. And for Vox and for whoever, you know, whoever up the chain. And that needs to be at the top of everyone's thoughts, right? Well, that to that point. So, like, that's the issue with ChatGPT is like it, you know, they come out and say, you know, they're factually inaccurate. It, it doesn't understand it's a predictive. And then you have Bing integrating, and now you have Bar from Google. And even with real time information retrieval, they're still saying, you know, you don't have factually accurate information all the time. It's still problematic. Do you predict at some point kind of a a synthesis of the knowledge model and the language model where it is reliable? Like how far away do you think we are before you can use Google, you can use Bing and actually feel confident 
that the NLG answers are going to be factually reliable? Um, this is the part where we get into Jeff prognostication. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, uh, disclaimer, we'll disclaimer, to, disclaimer, disclaimer, um, real close. Um, but we're going to be real close in use case by use case and mm-hmm. types of queries, just as good as I described there and challenging. And that's going to give potentially them uh, a head, or head, head start. Um, and I do believe that we're looking at a situation where, you know, the end of 2023 by the, you're going to have a, uh, the dream of teams at Google is a, uh, is artificial general intelligence. I mean, if you ask anyone there that's allowed to talk to you about it, that's the dream of everyone. If you're not, if that's not your dream, you don't work there very long. Does that scare you or are you optimistic about that? Whoever's very up, doing it? Very optimistic. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I want the level, I want the bar for quality of content to go up. That's all I want. I want the world, I want the world of low quality content to just disappear. Right. I, I don't want there to be a market to write one cent, two cent content. I mean, I, that may be a little bit heartless if your job is to write one cent, two cent content. That's my dream. And I think that that's going forward. So I don't think they will release something that is that. But I think they will release things that are getting closer to that. Right. And I think it will become less scary when it gets into use case dependent dynamics. Um, what's the name of the example? Uh, Minerva? Or Miranda, my brain is like I don't even. So there's 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 a, a project in Google that I I feel is oh you know oh I love reading you know this type of stuff. But uh, Minerva or Miranda, I, my brain I believe it's Minerva, um and it, it does uh, you know mathematic difficult mathematics, yeah algebraic yeah. equation type stuff. Okay, you, you can't punch those things into your LLM, right? right. And they can't get that result. So. Does that mean the AI doesn't do that? There's another thing that's being built to do these complicated mathematical problems, right? So it's just not the thing that you have access to, but those other things are being worked on, right? So what I hope that this brings, what Jeff, what I what I hope this brings is awareness that that GPT isn't AI. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not equals. It's an example of an application of AI. Right. Right. There's other things. So what does that mean? It means that Google's angle, Bing's angle, Yahoo's angle. I'm going there. Other other folks' angle. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm going there. They've got one of the best teams. They're assembling one of the best. I'm, teams wait, I'm waiting, waiting to see. In, I'm waiting to our, see. They got one of the best teams in our industry. I mean, I they're they're they're, they're killers. Um, and uh, it's been better and better every day. I watch their Yahoo announcements. I'm like. Actually got her. I, I've been watching. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to see what comes yeah. out. And Apple, they hired a, right. a, a, a you know, a, a, God, my brain is a Gian, 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 uh, Gian Andrea. Paul, Paul Gian Andrea has been working on that. He built, I mean, you can go look it up. Um, right. there, Apple's going to have a, 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 a melee into this. It's going to be use case specific that unlocks the public perception of what's possible. And it removes that equal equation of AI is Chappy GPT because that's that's really where the next two, three, four months is going to be. It's going to be some percentage of the human population is just going to lose interest. The other popul- gener- population is going to realize that this isn't the only accessible implementation of AI. Um, and then you're going to start to see Google really pull out their six shooters. And I saw this use case in intent. I saw that use case in intent. And then everyone else is going to go, oh, gosh, we have to be way smarter than we thought we were going to have to be to actually have products in this space. So um, final, and, and final by, the end of the, by the end of the year, Google will regain their ground. And then the only people, but Microsoft has amazing product managers um, and they're going to win massive corporate market share with their Azure products and their fine tuning products and all the fun stuff that happens in between. You asked for the, you asked for my, uh, no, I, I love my, it. My, my analysis. That's what it is. 
And and I think you know, like to to the Microsoft part, like all they need is like they're you, they're no one's going to overthrow Google in search. You know, all they need is a little bit of market share, and it's worth billions of dollars. But to bring it all back full circle and to wrap this up in the context of SEO, Google, Bing, ChatGPT, do you recommend do SEOs just stay the course and continue doing what they're doing, or? If you want to future proof your, you know, organic search visibility, do you, do they go in a different direction? You you've got to figure out ways to use the technology that's available to enhance and inspire creativity, to drive the goal for differentiated content, to make sure that you are really self-aware if you have inefficiencies um, that are exploitable. Um, you have to be much more introspective of your existing inventory of content and you, it, level it up, make it as great as it can be. Um, no, you, SEOs today have to have to look at their existing content and say, it's not, the answer isn't deleting them and redirecting them. The answer isn't, uh, optimizing them by popping a few keywords in it. The answer is everything I put out has to be putting my best foot forward or my brand's best foot forward and my blobs of content, the clusters, right? have to represent my business's expertise on a topic real well. And I have to stay on top of it. So pick your, pick the topics that you want to be a thought leader on and rec rec recognize that you have a living organism of all the content on your site or network if you're crossing. If you're cross-linking across network and in, in that type of way, and those are living organisms. And you have to use all the tools you have to make sure that that product, that collective of content, that product, that mass of goo, that cluster, that amoeba about the topic you love is as good as it can be every day. And use all the technology you've got so that that's the truth of your business. You can say, hey, CEO, what are we doing? We're making this collective of 222 pages that I think is the right 222 pages as beautiful as it can be. And we're going to make it as beautiful as it can be. What other things are we doing? We're doing support content. And we figured out a way to make a thousand pages this year. Last year, we could only make 500. But they're great support pages. And what do they do? They make it so that when someone lands on our site, they have a way to self-discover that we actually understand their industry. Mm -hmm. Not just CRM in general, but CRM for breweries. Okay? Before we couldn't have written that article. And everybody needs to have the aha moment that they're all having the same aha moment Washington Post had when they said we couldn't cover all the elections or all the Olympic events. And now we can. So you, for you as an SEO, need to go back and say, have your Olympic event or election coverage moment for your business or your client. That's the goal today. This is, it's so awesome. And it, and it is a clear blueprint. It's like as complex as it is, it's all about simplifying and focusing in and not being too distracted, but using this technology to your advantage. Jeff, this is awesome. Um, thank you so much for being my guest. If somebody does want to get in touch with you online, I know you are all over the socials, but where, where can they find you? Uh, LinkedIn, certainly shoot me a note, reference this, uh, Jeff at marketmuse.com. Twitter is Jeffrey underscore coil. Um, those are my main stomping grounds. Um, and, you know, I respond to everything. I love this stuff. If you, I'll, I'll even, I'll even, I'll even look at your website. I'll tell you stuff about your website. You don't even know. Um, he's I, not even kidding. He's not even kidding. Not I, I love this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I, thanks, Garrett. It, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to our next chat. Me too. My name is Garrett Sussman of I Pull Rank. This has been another episode of the Rankable Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week. Peace. Oh,